Thank you. Welcome, welcome everyone. I hope those that are finishing their coffee can come in so we can continue with the with the proceedings. I think everybody wants to run away. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, so yeah, uh, good morning and, and, and welcome to, to this uh, second session of the of the day. My name is Carlos Rey Moreno. I am the program manager at the Association for Progressive Communications. And I'm going to be the moderator of this session um, today. Uh, APC is a membership-based organization of uh, uh, activists and, and civil society organizations founded in the 90s uh, to empower communities through ICTs to contribute to equitable human development, social justice, and participatory policy processes. Uh, since our inception, uh, we've been very active members of the civil society stakeholder group in internet governance, uh, multi-stakeholder approaches, and we, we participate regularly and so do our members at national, regional, and global IGFs. Uh, in this session, we are gonna discuss uh, governing data in Asia Pacific. And uh, yeah, we aim to outline uh, key components of data governance, such as data stewardship and data security and privacy. Uh, we will explore how we can best contribute to a trustworthy management of data through policies that are put in place to ensure the availability, integrity, privacy, and security of data assets. And this session will also facilitate the, the exchange of best practices among the region and beyond by exploring the following guiding questions. How can countries strengthen data governance in the region, ensuring data protection and privacy? What challenges are policymakers facing in the region? And how can policymakers enhance trust and establish data policies for managing data through its life cycle from creation acquisition to storage usage and disposal. To do so, we have here with us uh, Ms. Maiko Meguro, Meguro, apologies, who is the Director for International Data Strategy and International Affairs at the, at the Digital Agency of Japan, where she currently leads the data free flow with trust at the government of Japan. Ms. Meguro is joining us online, welcome. Uh, we have also Fitri Bintang, who is Southeast Asia Visiting Research Fellow at the Interna International Institute for Strategic Studies and a research consultant at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, Fitriani research uh, covers Southeast Asia, Asian cybersecurity, peacekeeping, radical and extremist groups, Indonesian politics and foreign policy, uh, as well as women, peace and security agenda. Fitri is also joining us online. And here with me, I have uh, Ms. Anju Mangal, is the, the outgoing chair of the Asia Pacific IGF. She's here on a personal capacity, but is working for the USAID Digital Connectivity and Cybersecurity Project. She's passionate about supporting the Asia and the Pacific region by contributing to bridging the digital divide and supporting persons with disabilities, youth, women, and communities in the rural and remote areas. So to unpack this, this topic, uh, the session will start by a panel discussion where Ms. Maiko uh, will share her, her expertise on data governance, governance as the lead of the data free flow with trust. Then uh, Ms. Fitri will present uh, the Association of uh, Southeast Asian Nations best practices and perspectives on data governance. And finally, Ms. Anju will share her Asia Pacific regional perspective and expertise on data governance. Uh, because we started the session a bit late, I will uh, uh, ask the speakers to, to, to keep the presentation a bit uh, shorter so we can have some uh, open floor exchange after the end of the presentations. Um, and yeah, so thank you very much. And with that, um, if we can open uh, for uh, online participation, uh, Ms. Meguro, I will appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nana. 
And good morning, honorable members of the national parliament from the participating nations. And it is a very much pleasure to meet you and present the recent development on the policy track on data people with trust to develop international cooperation on trustworthy, interoperable data governance in the light of information, uh, data information and, and data access internationally. So I'm Michael Megro, uh, as kindly uh, introduced, director in charge of leading international data strategy and advancing DFFT at the digital agency of the government of Japan. Um, so I think I am using a slide. So do, do you think you can put up the slide that I have sent you? Well, if not, I'm happy to also put my own slide here. Uh, yes, I will. I will do my own slide. Yeah. Right. Oops. It says that I can't actually share my own thing here. Ah, actually, the secretary has started sharing my slide. I think. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Okay. So the title is "Advancing Data Free for the Trust." So in the, yes, thank you very much. So in this slide, um, data people with trust, uh, DFFT is basically the concept for those who doesn't know about this concept. Uh, it is a cross-border free flow of data should be um, enhanced through the promotion of trust, uh, namely the enhancing protection of privacy, security, intellectual properties, and any other legitimate interests so that citizens and the federal governments can support the increasing flow of data produced and stored in respective jurisdiction without a threat of their critical interests. So the concept was first endorsed at the G20 Osaka in 2019. Then as we, as will be explained, um, we endorsed and developed by the subsequent G20 and G7 every year. Then in 2023, this year, G7 Hiroshima summit endorsed the establishment of Institutional Arrangement for Partnership, IAP, uh, which is the international mechanism to facilitate intergovernmental and multi-stakeholder cooperation operational DFFT and the facilitated cross-border flow of data. Um, this mechanism has been endorsed by the G7, but this mechanism is actually the membership is much wider. So this is quite open global uh, mechanism as is planned. So the importance of DFFT, data free for trust, actually this is almost like without need for explanation. Now that data economy is booming, and of course, um, in order to develop the data economy, high quality of data access is critical um, in order to solve the social issues ranging from aging society to climate change or even healthcare issues. And of course, driving the economy growth, it is essential to develop interoperability um, through the coordinating international data transfer rules among the major countries, advanced technological solutions, certificate standards, et cetera, et cetera. So which means that we really have to find any different approaches, like anything that can enhance interoperability, we better work on that. So that is a point of this slide. So next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So as I said, the concept of DFFT has been endorsed by the G20 in 2019. And since then, G7, G20 has discussed how to advance this concept and what is more, the, how to materialize and operationalize these concepts by developing in the areas of the priorities and also expanding the topic scope from the global market issue to the sustainable development. Uh, which was quite a critical um, advancement uh, in 2022 by the G20 um, Indonesian presidency on the digital ministers meeting. So please, uh, next, next slide, please. Thank you. So on the materialization of the DFFT, since 2019, um, I think we have seen vastly two approaches. One approach is to develop 
the relevant trade rules on data free flow and identifying illegal practices such as certain types of data localization or government accesses. Um, this type of working track has been materialized already in 2019 at Osaka, what is called Osaka track at the G20 summit in 2019. But on the other, with an, an, an emphasis of today's presentation is this other approach is to seek for the interoperable solutions across the different national regimes and national demands on privacy security without evaluating whether certain national regulation to be good or bad. In this regard, it is more important um, to develop a forum where we could discuss the actual gaps or we share the best practices or we share the needs for capacity building as no one actually have the good views on how the data globally flows or how the value chain are constructed or what are the business and technological practices on the cross-border transport data and yes, what are the risk line. So I will come back to this point in the next slide, but we definitely see the new tracks in addition to the trade rule track about more pragmatic, more focus on the technology and regulatory cooperation based on evidence uh, on what is actually happening for data rather than speaking what is good or what is bad. And in terms of the scope of DFFT, which is thanks to the, the great effort by the Indonesian presidency of G20, um, we have seen the new track of working on the data free flow trust, which significantly contribute to our sustainable development goal. So this line of discussion has been very well curbed as I said, by the G20 uh, in 2022, and kudos to our colleague from Indonesia. So to reduce, for example, data inequality, this is like a really important topic uh, when it comes to our, our new agenda on the DFFT, because um, like, I, I, like I wrote here, many people are still excluded from the new world of data economy um, because of the perhaps like language or perhaps lack of technological infrastructure, lack of education, remoteness, and many different reasons. So a wide range of actions needed, including building capacity, uh, especially for the least developed countries or landlocked developing countries or small, uh, small, small island developing countries. So under the banner of DFFT, we can certainly see the importance of working on the international cooperation in this sort of um, issues. And of course, like healthcare, um, tracking climate change, uh, tackling climate change, and realizing energy efficient economy globally uh, require a series of policy coordination, as well as benefit of technological advancement, including tracking data on the carbon footprint across supply chain and have better side of our energy use globally. Or of course, tackling public health emergency, such as COVID-19 pandemic in such cases, interoperability between national and uh, sub-national health data management system becomes increasingly important to curb the spread of infection globally. So see, uh, we've started to see the concept started from the trade view, then now it's slowly expanding its um, scope and also the usefulness or types of function that can play in terms of enhancing the cross-world transport data. So please, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so like I said, importance is we're not, nowadays we're not the phase of discussing what are the trusts, what would be the data free flow. It's, we're not talking about the concept. We have to operationalize it. And in terms of operationalize it, we see the very important thing in, uh, we, we see very important three things as I presented here. First, the discussion on the operationalization or advancement of DFFT have to be evidence-based and solution-oriented. Since uh, many of what we call barriers of the cross-border transfer data are coming from the difference of the regulations, a different way to pin down on the, the legitimate interest. And often it is very difficult to point the finger at others' privacy regulation and say, hey, your privacy regulation is like disguised, the trade barrier, et cetera, et cetera. This is really impragmatic. So be pragmatic. Let's say that we all respect for the different regulatory needs and concern based on the different national circumstances. But always we have to start from the actual issues lying there. If we don't have the solution to flow the data here and there, we, we're not going to have the future that we envisage, which can be, which can only be realized by having the enough access to data globally. 
But we also have to respect the different regulatory needs. We don't have to criticize each other. So we just first, we just capture what is happening based on evidence and think about the solution rather than talking about the norms. That is a very important attitude towards uh, talking about cross-border transfer data topic. And second, the need for tangible progress on advancing TFFT, because we can continue talking, 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 talking forever at G7, G20, but we definitely have to work on advancing, which means that we need an actual place, the forum where we gather the relevant actors and continue working on the project where we can actually produce the solutions. But the problem here is that we don't have the actual forum that we can talk about cross-border, cross-sectoral topic of data. Like trade have the WTO, finance have the financial stability board, but data, we don't have the place. That is the issue. That is why here, the third point, we need a new mechanism to bring government and stakeholders together to cooperate on facilitating cross-border flows of personal and non-personal data under the banner of DFFT. Okay, next slide, please. So this is something that Japanese government and also the OECD has been working together to develop the, the institutional, the, 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 the develop as a solution for the DFFT. And this um, proposal has also been discussed by the G7. Uh, so the proposal of institutional arrangement of partnership is we need a flexible, much stakeholder, evidence-based and solution-driven forum to bring together the relevant people and work on the agenda, produce a solution to operationalize DFFT. So those institutions should have at least three elements. First, a certain governmental body with relevant expertise and competence to discuss and actually work on the, the topic of DFFT. And second, we need, to have, we need to have a stakeholder organ to communicate with government and work together uh, to, 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 to produce the solutions. And third, most importantly, we need a permanent secretariat to manage the meeting um, project and other administrative issues because often those multi stakeholders, the forum is ad hoc, but ad hoc forum cannot produce the continuous project because often the project takes three, four years. So we set the agenda, we start project, we review the project, and we bring it through to all solutions. That takes time. So that is why we need a permanent secretariat in order to move forward with DFFT. So this is just a concept, but we kind of thinking into uh, the developing the mechanism, what is called institutional arrangement of partnership. So to, to work on the question of cross-border transfer of data in general, and this should have the, should have the vision from the Asia Pacific where the innovation digitalization is happening rapidly. What well, I would say the most innovative area of the world should lead this sort of project and should have the, should lead the, the global solution setting uh, in the field of cross-border transfer of data based on the advanced practices and also the diversity that this region withhold. So, so I think we're right, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm closing my, my, my speech, but this is the up-to-date development in the track of the facilitating cross-border transfer of data and data free food trust, where we actually set up the general forum, where we bring together the multi stakeholder, continuously discuss and work on the common project to tackle on our common issues, common agenda on, on, on developing the, the digitalized world and, and wealth. And of course, like the, the, the trust, which is brought by all those common projects. So next slide, please. Okay, so this is just the, the, the advertisement, but this is just a DA50 brochure to provide up-to-date information on progress about data free flow with trust. This content uh, is always up-to-date, so please access to this QR code and you, you have all the information you need to, to understand this topic. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, uh, for giving us the background on the DA50 and and the, the issues and the challenges, as well as the benefits that it will bring uh, together with the, the need for, for that forum to exchange ideas and how that, that proposal that, that, that you are putting forward could, could address those, those elements and foster that, that exchange of information in between the government and stakeholders. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, with that, um, uh, can we um, open the, the participation for uh, Frit Fritiani, please, for her presentation? She's online. Welcome. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for having me. I saw that my slides have been shared. Um, esteemed and distinguished uh, member of parliament of the Asia Pacific, uh, as an academic, I would be, I think, much more candid to see what happened in the region, what works and what hasn't worked in regard to uh, a collection of country in the 10 uh, Southeast Asian country and perhaps the wider region um, in terms of how we can go forward uh, in regard of data governance, especially when there's country, there are country that not as mature digitally um, compared to other. Now, uh, if I can move on to the next slide on um, on the issues that I will cover. Uh, first, I would look at and how countries have been strengthening data governance, and I will focus my uh, presentation on data uh, protection and privacy as that issue has been a concern for the region I'm in. Uh, the second is what are the challenge for policymakers facing in the region in regard to data governance and how can policymaker enhance uh, trust and establish data policies? As we know, such uh, action uh, can be limited and challenging. And uh, last point, I will share the situation in the region um, that I work in. Uh, first, on the next slide, please. Um, I want to share the concern of how data uh, cycle from, uh, from data creation, storage, uh, sharing, uh, archival, and therefore the uh, uh, de deletion afterward have been managed uh, with the concern of how there is a primary use and a secondary use of data and how it is um, uh, utilized uh, and it can be recycled by those that uh, in the store in have this ability to storage of data and we all know that not uh, all the region and countries have the abilities to manage its data as therefore um, impacted to the challenges of the mis, uh, mistreatment and non-equal treatment, the issue of um, discrimination, as well as access to fundamental uh, democracy right. And this is something that uh, can be concerning when in regard to data. If I can go to the next slide, uh, I will show what uh, in the Southeast Asia region has been doing um, in the regional level to provide countries that is small and developing in terms of um, digital digital side. Countries such as Laos, uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, um, and to an extent um, perhaps um, Philippines don't see cybersecurity as an issue. And therefore uh, perhaps there is a benefit for the uh, regional organization to set up a framework on digital data governance as um, a benchmarking and a standardization settings for those countries that still need of reference guide in terms of how to do data management. For example, uh, having a data classification framework, having cross-border data flow mechanism, uh, as well as innovation forum and uh, digital protection and privacy forum. And uh, this is in a way not to uh, actually dictate smaller countries that is still developing um, its data management uh, in a way that it want to provide a lesson learned and how uh, the country have done things um, that and can be done uh, in the constraint of uh, sovereignty and limited resource. And if um, the concern is on how to establish law, the parliamentarian present here understand so well how 
it takes time to produce a legislation. And although we have all this regional framework, if we can go to the next slide, only five out of 10 countries in the region have actually a law that governs data in uh, specific on data protection and privacy because the process takes so long. For example, Indonesia, where my country um, is, uh, it takes uh, almost a decade to have a personal data protection law, although we learn from other countries in the region that have similar data 10 years before, such as Singapore. And uh, the discussion has been ongoing. Um, and perhaps countries in the region uh, that have closer proximity in terms of culture, as well as developing governmental model, perhaps understand how, uh, the importance of data governance. Um, it is still a challenge internally to create law, especially when there's a multi uh, sector and multi stakeholder interests in terms of, for example, taking um, example for Indonesia again, a uh, challenge from the private sector, for example, that would want in the process of creating legislation would argue more um, regulation in a protection and data privacy would entail uh, increasing costs of data compliance, for example, or regulation compliance. And uh, as a country, we want to have a prosperous economic to increase the welfare, but of course we went we want to uh, protect the, the privacy data um, and uh, privacy uh, as well. Uh, so there is a challenge that would need to be balanced uh, by lawmaker. Uh, if we learn from outside Southeast Asia in the next slide, we learn um, best practices in other countries and their interests as well. And it is actually um, dominated by, or driven, uh, uh, dominated is a bad word, apologies, but driven by countries that already have uh, its capital and um, commodities and advantage uh, when it comes to manage data. Uh, for example, for cross-border e-commerce data flow, for enabling um, uh, cross-border digital delivery products, uh, as well as um, uh, protecting source code for commercial product from forced disclosure uh, to national authorities. So uh, that uh, cooperation in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, for example, um, have been agreed uh, and pushed forward by advanced countries and adopted by other countries as well. So in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, countries like the US, um, Australia, um, Japan, uh, Malaysia to an extent, uh, and in Singapore, uh, probably uh, would then uh, bring their learning uh, best practices to countries such as Brunei, uh, as well as Vietnam in terms of uh, data regulation. Um, the US-Mexico agreement, uh, actually we learned about how um, a cross-border privacy rule system uh, will bring in the APAC uh, region, the US-Japan trade um, uh, uh, digital trade agreement as well has been a, a good learning uh, point for data governance, as well as Singapore-Australia digital economic agreement. Uh, if we can continue to the next slide, we know what are the main issues when it regards to uh, uh, regulating the what Michael in the previous presentation mentioned on data free flow with trust. There's an issue of data localization, whether when a country wants its data to be protected uh, and not shared, for example, on the election data. There's issue of regulation cooperation, uh, who controls what, and sometimes within a country, there's a different sector that want to control the data as well, and sometimes that discussion are not going well. There's the issue of the government want to do taxing and how does in terms of data flow, um, the data would be taxed and who will pay the tax and whether uh, a certain country will get the data used by other country to, to do trade, but then uh, not benefit from that. And how this data sharing approach will be done. Uh, which uh, from, for example, private sector um, uh, and uh, public sector in regards to um, 
uh, in sector that is benefiting for all, as mentioned, like healthcare, education, transport, energy, and um, in regard for security um, that uh, we witness uh, has been challenging. Uh, so the progress has been discussed in the economic uh, sector uh, and grouping like the G20 and the G20, uh, G10, uh, G7. Uh, but the question again, um, what uh, will the policy maker bring home and how they actually uh, discuss nationally. So if I can go to the next slide, I um, uh, key in for the three uh, issues that being uh, brought. The, uh, what's the benefit for the country when the data is unevenly distributed? Uh, how is for the uh, national country population that is not online? And the third is the issue for developing countries as they are the provider of low, raw data. They don't have the capability to actually um, uh, generate advance uh, more and being used as the consumer of tech from other country uh, without actually having um, the benefit to uh, be uh, uh, having the incentive for that uh, has been a concern. And if we can go to the next approach, we also, oh, the next slide, we also see how the different, uh, the issues of different data governance landscape between one country and another. And the second is the fragmentation of approach in the double. Uh, global data governance. For example, how in the US, the data is controlled by the private sector, uh, even the government have difficulty of access to it. Well, ten in China, for example, the gov government control the data while the U European Union focus on uh, its individual approach. Um, and this fragmentation hampers um, the collaboration among jurisdiction. And this is something that needs to be discussed and included in the uh, government policy making. If we can go to the two next slide, I know my time is over, uh, uh, almost over. I, I mentioned about how the challenge in uh, the region um, to produce, for example, a law on digital protection, uh, let alone that the government in general, we need to um, learn how to, in the next slide, uh, to, to build trust and establish data policies in managing data throughout its life cycle in the creation, uh, acquisition, uh, to storage usage and disposal of data, whether our law have been um, strong enough in regard to this and whether the uh, the policy maker and the people at large uh, know about uh, the issue. And uh, next, perhaps we can consider the, the, the flow, the usage and flow of data, uh, whether we understand this and how we would manage this in the data governance um, and uh, facilitate the, the data access and exchange among public bodies and then therefore internationally. Um, uh, and then uh, from this, we can learn the lesson learned of what needs to be there in the next uh, slide, please, as I close. Uh, in concluding, uh, what countries, uh, uh, parliamentarian and policymaker perhaps would need to embark on um, on the four point, the in the next slide, I will say uh, first on creating the legal basis um, of uh, data governance. Um, uh, what are the value points needs to be protected? Uh, if we can go to the next slide, in terms of um, it's. Uh, for example, what is important uh, to be regulated in a country, whether it's human rights, privacy rights, or is it a government uh, security and public trust building, for example. So parliamentarians need to focus on that when creating uh, uh, legislation on data government. But legal basis need to be done before the whole governance can move because otherwise it will be considered illegal. And uh, legislation uh, will provide uh, time and funding uh, for this. And also uh, in relate of providing technical guidance. So technical guidance can uh, we can get from international and regional back practices. 
uh, as well as having the awareness of data management and utilization. The last point, uh, perhaps in this forum, I would want to push for uh, the collaboration of all relevant stakeholders, both nationally and internationally, um, as a way to um, a successful data uh, governance management. And, uh, and by that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vitriani, for, for giving us uh, such a perspective on the region and, and the challenges uh, that uh, policymakers face, as well as the, the lessons learned no, through, through the different activities that have and initiatives that have taken place. Uh, I want to, there are, there has been some, sorry, I didn't recognize the, the participants online before, and thank you for, for engaging already in the chat, and please pose your questions there, and I, I will bring them to the to the to the speakers uh, in the in the Q and A session in the open on the open floor, uh, but uh, we have one last intervention before we go to the exchange, and this is from from Andrew. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thanks, Carlos. I promise to make a very short intervention because we're already running out of time, and I think I'm gonna want to hear from you in terms of what you are doing on data management or data even storage use usage etc. Um, I do want to acknowledge uh, the team uh, working at, as in the, sorry, the participants uh, joining online. Thank you so much. I also see a comment from Cheryl in terms of, you know, um, collaboration and how do we engage and, you know, uh, in terms of uh, the regional multi-stakeholder or even the countries in uh, when it comes to continuity or even projects, when we look at sustainability. I think that's a really, really good point. Um, so I'm here on a personal capacity, but I do work um, on USAID digital connectivity and cybersecurity. And we work with 12 uh, member countries, but here I'm also, I've left the, the APRIGF chair. And <laughs> I'm now an ex uh, chair, yeah. <laughs> um, Anyway, I, I'm not going to go into detail in terms of the discussions that have uh, taken place from, because our two colleagues um, from Asia has clearly defined what does it really mean when we talk about data management and data governance, right? Um, it's everything you do to ensure data is secure, private, um, it's accurate, available, and usable. And by usable, I mean that when you think about data, you do not just think about yourself as a user, but think about people who are going to use the data and for what reasons in terms of like the key sectors, um, the disability community, and you know, the youth, gender, et cetera, right? The women, uh, basically, because we are actually collecting data about them. So being very mindful about how you collect data and when you collect data in a country or even in a region, I think it's important to always say that what you are doing with that data it is very important to tell the people exactly what you are planning to do with the data. And that's one of the things that I think I see a lot in terms of like the countries um, also struggling. Um, and the other point is you should be able to differentiate there's open data, but there's also the confidential private data. Open data is open um, and you know, there's, there is a dev data governance structure and framework to it, but in terms of confidential private data, I think we really uh, need to be careful because that also uh, ties to data sovereignty issues in those countries. I'll give you two examples of projects that we've done. So years ago, when I was working for a regional organization, we developed the regional data portal. So it's called the Pacific Data Hub. You can also Google it if you want. Um, it houses data from 1940s, 1930s. And all those data also has metadata. It describes each of those data that was collected by so many people years ago. So um, that data is already available online. Um, Lefau, you mentioned something about climate change earlier, and I know that internet governance, when you talk about climate change, uh, that data itself was, you could actually use that data to understand the reality of climate change, even in terms of, you know, just thinking um, what the projection would be 
or what the reality would be. And I think that to your point in terms of data governance, uh, sorry, internet governance, I think that's one of the things that the portal has, right? Um, that data belongs to the countries that was collected by so many people in terms of regional organizations. It was collected by organizations, environmental organizations. It was collected by um, um, various you know, consultants coming into the Pacific um, and, and also you know, uh, uploaded to, to that portal. Now, one of that, the data houses climate change data, uh, sorry, the, the portal houses climate change data, fisheries, agriculture, you also have gender statistics, et cetera. Um, you look at it, like what are the reality in terms of the youths, et cetera. So um, it also has APIs, which means it, um, it creates uh, that uh, link between one portal to another, right? I'm gonna keep it very simple. I'm not gonna go into technical terms, but that API was very useful to create because you could actually align to the different organizations that are collecting the same data. So making sure that you, you, you don't um, have repetition and duplicating of efforts. Um, but one of the things that we discussed during that time when we were creating that data portal was data governance framework and also data government governance right itself. Um, and it was important that there was buy in from the governments or from the countries that uh, that uh, that we were, uh, you know, uploading the data from. So um, that has that was discussed at a higher level, but at the you know, when you look at a multi-stakeholder level, it did not trickle down to the grassroots or people who are actually collecting that data. So that was one of the um, issues that we faced. Um, but it, going forward, I think one of the good thing is that they have started structuring and and ensuring that there is proper data management uh, framework for that. The other project, and I'm glad Anya is sitting here uh, through you and Dessa, uh, on data management frameworks in Cambodia, Laos, uh, and Bangladesh. And um, I know there was reference to some of the developed countries. And when you look at the developed countries in terms of data governance, there's funding, there's resources, there's people actually collecting, disseminating, and sharing this data. There are people that are actually analyzing this data. A lot of that uh, the reality is for some of these uh, small island states or even developing countries, they don't have uh, sufficient resources to actually um, help with data management. So I wanted to make that emphasis because this was a struggle when we were working with those three countries, Cambodia, Laos and Bangladesh. And honestly, these countries, they have amazing people. They're brilliant. They did hard work and they put together a multi-stakeholder approach. They put together an agenda inviting people from other sectors to be part of that multi-stakeholder approach in terms of understanding how we can uh, ensure data management in, 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 in the government. And the other aspect was to bring in other, uh, uh, sorry, other sectors like the Bureau of Statistics, understanding how they actually collect data, understanding the naming conventions, what sort of classification, data classification uh, approach they use to actually collect data. So that multi-stakeholder model then became, uh, you know, it was such a good model that uh, they are still continuing that discussion. They're still discussing, they're still working behind the scenes. And now they've gone ahead to create a steering committee for each of those countries. And these committees and members are reaching out to all the sectors to make sure uh, data, you know, they're talking about data management, but also doing, creating data privacy, data protection and laws. And this is con still being supported by UNDESA, which is great. I was also part of that project years ago. Um, and going forward, our plans for the Pacific, um, we're looking at engaging governments to start with the regional training and also baseline study on, study on where the countries are in relation to data management. Um, it will be a demand different approach. We are not going to say, yes, you know, we're coming to you. No, it's going to be the countries telling us what they want, how they want it, and what do they understand by the whole data management. We've been talking to, for example, FAO's team in Samoa. Uh, we've been talking to Vanuatu, Fiji. And these are the people, these are the champions doing so much work. But in terms of just understanding what the regional framework is and how they are going to learn from each other is what we are going to convene from October onwards. But again, it's going to be these champions at the table 
telling us and talking about the situation and not being told by some donors or partners or other you know regional organizations that's how it should be done but the way we want to do it is ensure that it, we are very intentional with our approach and not just do it for the sake of doing it because it's something um, to tick the box. So no, that's not the approach that we are um, using. And I think it's important to, to remind people because when we, want, when we, understand, when we talk about multi-stakeholder, right? Um, sometimes you're just focusing on one particular sector, but for, you're forgetting that there's so many other people that have been collecting data, using data. They also want to understand what are some, some of the policies, some of the uh, data protection laws in those countries. Um, there's some countries that are already working on good, uh, um, sorry, what was it? Uh, data cloud, uh, cloud, data, uh, cloud infrastructure policies, which is great. And this is, is also going to be part of the discussion that we have in October. Um, the, you know, the, the, the speakers have already mentioned quite a lot of stuff in terms of coordination, um, collaboration. I think those are very key, but one of the things that I want to emphasize is fostering ownership. This data belongs to the countries, this data belongs to the people, and making sure that there is accountability, not only from a country perspective, but also from a regional and development partner perspective in terms of how do we support them. And um, I think my final one is that um, try, we're trying very hard to, um, to kind of reduce or maybe you know, get rid of data silos. It's happening a lot and it continues to happen. When there is a new funding or a new project coming in, they don't see what's happened previously in, 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 in those organizations in terms of data collection, et cetera they go and repeat the same thing. So that's one thing that we are trying to avoid is to make sure that everybody understand what has already been collected, what has already been done before we start something new or a new project that's working on data management or frameworks. Sorry, I was a bit more. No, it's fine. You have a lot of experience and I'm glad that you've shared all those practical implications of collecting, analyzing and, and engaging with, with different stakeholders into what does it mean to use data for the benefit and, and of the different of the different of the people in in every country right so thank you very much uh, to the three speakers i think it's at least i've learned a lot uh, and i hope uh, the rest of the audience online and on site uh, have learned too uh, any now i i would like to to open the floor to any reflections any questions that you may have any feedback that you would like to do in, to, that, that that you you would like to express in relation to this rather broad topic and, and, and challenging that has, and it will have uh, very important implications going forward. So let me look at the online chat in case someone else, no. So our online participants are also welcome to, to, to write on the chat and I will, I will read the question out for the speakers. No, everyone, no comments, no question, no feedback. I think everybody is well versed with data management now, right? <laughs> It'd be interesting to hear from your perspective, what is it that you're doing in the countries in terms of data management or um, even, oh, sorry, data governance and data frameworks, data management frameworks. We're here to learn. No hands online, no hands on site. Okay, well, um, I guess everyone is, sorry, might be some comment here that I'm not able to read. No, that was the one from Cheryl before. Um, okay, so I think with that, uh, let me, sorry if I cut you short, uh, maybe there are some some uh, last comments or last uh, reflections. Ah, there is a, Exactly, Michael. I was gonna pass the floor uh, the floor to you and to F Fitriani as well as to Anju for some remarks, some reflections uh, from your experience from that uh, that may come uh, from having listened to the other participants. Uh, so, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. 
So I was very much intrigued by Anya's uh, presentation on the top, uh, particularly on the part that you mentioned the issue of accountability and ownership. I mean, you, you're definitely right. That aspect has been quite neglected when we talk about the question of international data governances. But then at the same time, we're kind of wondering, for example, I, I was in charge of the data people trust and trying to establish a place where we can discuss, okay, what are the accountability? What is the project that we can help? What perhaps like we can know how the data to actually handle? Let's see how we can have a better way of the country, et cetera. So we, we, I kind of leading the, the, the place where we can work on those projects. But then I'm kind of wondering, uh, in terms of your proposal on enhancing accountability, what would be the most emitment issues, or if we have any idea that how we can actually work on this topic together, we, I would like to really hear about this from you. Maybe, uh, can, you, yes, can you repeat the question, please? For Anju, around accountability? Yes. Do you mind, do you mind uh, Meguro, uh, repeating the, the question? Hear? Okay, so my question was, so do you hear me? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, good. So my question was, so in terms of your proposal on, you know, more focus on fostering ownership and accountability, which is the, the, the point with, you know, the, the, where the data belongs to people, countries, but then reflecting there is a, a country. But I was kind of wondering, what would be your concrete idea about how to actually enhance that accountability? And particularly um, in terms of when we are talking about two different societies, but we're communicating data each other. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you or maybe is it just me or is it, do you mean accountability, uh, government or two organizations or, sorry, it's not very okay. clear, maybe can you read the, the transcription? Well, I have just said, you have just said you're talking about we need to enhance the accountability on the side of people, countries who own the data, right? But then question is, when we're talking about the situation, we face a two different society where we to have a completely different idea about ownership, et cetera, since this topic hasn't been discussed across the state and societies, how would you solve this problem? Because I was kind of thinking about, because I'm, I'm a policymaker, I'm thinking about actual measures, actual policy, which can help on the topic of accountability. So I was wondering what would be your demand for policymakers, for example, in terms of enhancing accountability? Thanks. I, I hope I understand the question. But in terms of accountability, when I spoke about accountability and ownership, first, accountability to me is being accountable to the people, um, especially the ones that you're collecting data from. Um, because unfortunately, what's happening right now in a lot of the countries, and also when we were doing the work in, in the regional organization, is when we go, we collect data, we come, we analyze it, we upload it, but we don't do follow-ups. Um, and I'm not saying that I'm, I'm specifically uh, talking about one, one particular organization, etc., but it's just happening a lot. And being accountable, not just to your organization, but also to the people outside of the organization, because that's their data, it belongs to them. So I know there are quite a lot of challenges. One of the things in terms of accountability, one of the things that we saw um, was that uh, there, like I said earlier, there are lots of people coming in, there's lots of consultants, there's a lot of organizations, there's a lot of projects happening, and they collect a lot of this data. Um, where does that data go is one question. How is that data used is the second question. Who is going to use that data? And how is that data going to make an impact on the ground? Because you are actually doing those data collection for the people that you're working for or the stakeholders that you're working for. And I don't see that a lot. I don't see that happening in a lot of the big organizations that we work in. Um, but again, it's about, we need to show that respect to the countries. We need to be able to say that these countries are doing incredible work. 
many uh, don't have the capacity, but that's where we, you know, some people come in to support it. But at the same time, I think it's important that uh, when you are doing projects, particularly for countries, it's not just ticking the box, it's being intentional when it comes to accountability, being intentional to the people that you are actually involving in the project. That's probably one thing that I probably forgot to mention. Lefau wants to speak. I think I, <clears throat> I'd just like to add on to a very important point that you raised, and too, about the, um, the importance of having the data that reflects the actual um, service that is happening in the country. I mean, obviously, I made a point on Monday or Tuesday on the fact that some data was presented that, that says the penetration of the fixed um, internet, it's absolutely zero percentage when it's not the case in my country. So it's really frustrating to see that, but it's important to, for us to work together on, on that issue. I mean, honestly, the government of Samoa will be very disappointed. Um, to see that because um, it's not the true reflection of the uh, market at the moment. But from my point of view as the CEO, as the advisor of government, I would like to see where the caps are so that I can improve on it, I can work on it, I can talk to people that can be able to help us verify this data because um, it needs to be done. We, we, we don't want, this is kind of misinformation that we're putting online um, which we'll discuss every day, and yet we are the very people creating this misinformation. So it's important that we work together on this, and I would like to see any solution on, on this. How, how can we go in to fix it? You know, how, how, what's, what's the problem? How, who's going to do it? I mean, from the government perspective, we would like to, um, we would like to work with different organizations. I mean, Honestly, United Nations has a lot of different agencies. ITU has their own data. UNDP has their own data. UNESCO has their own data. FAO has their own data. And they need to work together. We all have to work together. Yep. That's just not right. Yep. Something has to be done. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much for that reflection. And um, yeah, also the different stakeholders and the different entry points that they have to this debate, right? Like uh, maybe Fitriani, going back to your comments around the different resources that different actors in the in the region have to to actually uh, take part in this in the management of data and the like. I don't know if there is any co you know kind of closing remarks from yourself in relation to this um, to this discussion. And then I will pass it to Michael and then to Andrew to finalize. Uh, thank you for um, raising that. I think uh, the different uh, different resources that country has, as well as a different knowledge, awareness, as well as priorities, often um, makes it difficult for us to collaborate. But I think it's something that we need to bridge. I am uh, keen to hear more uh, about Michael uh, uh, Maguro mentioned about these her um, initiative of creating. Um, a global uh, institution to um, to regulate the data free flow, and and how we can probably work on what free and how it flow and whether we can benefit from all because the concern of it sometimes it's free for those that I can, you know, benefit from it, but the countries that produce the data and perhaps portray the data inaccurately. Uh, needs to to you know have you know access and uh, you know a way to to voice as well um uh, and set things right and benefit from the international data arrangement that's for me thank you so much thank you thank you very much and you know great that this panel somehow has created that link in between you two so you can potentially take online that collaboration and take this somewhere uh, Michael, any, any concluding remarks from you? Oh, thank you very much for the great panel. Um, hearing from the completely different aspects and also different layers uh, of this topic was quite a learning. And I really uh, impressed by the question which has been just been set by the uh, Fritani about 
how we could work on the question of free flow of data when we have the reality of different resources or different national circumstances, which have the different degree of the benefit that they can get from actual fluid flow. So yeah, it's a great, um, uh, the, the, the great fruits of thought. And thank you very much for this um, discussion, Father. But I believe that having the general forum to talk about cross-border transfer of data and especially cutting the things from the free trade or trade rule topic, uh, rather than focus on a more pragmatic side, we can work on SDGs, we can work on technological cooperation. Uh, I think that type of forum is very much helpful. But thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very, uh, very much, Michael. Um, Andrew, any concluding remarks? Uh, uh, I, I guess in terms of just looking forward, I mean, go, going forward or, or having a forward looking approach and what Lefau said in terms of coordination, I think, and multi-stakeholder, when we use the word multi-stakeholder, sometimes we just use it for the sake of saying it. But are we really involving those stakeholders when we go back to the countries? Are we bringing those champions here in these events to actually talk about some of these issues that are happening in their countries? So I just wanna say that anything to do with data or anything to do with internet governance, um, data governance, sorry, um, or the work that we're doing, um, we have to keep reminding ourselves that there are people out there who are just doing amazing work and these are the champions collecting the data managing the data analyzing the data and just making sure that there is a voice for them to be part of these forums it would be great and um, also involving them at every in every step of your work uh, because i've seen a lot like i said projects come and go there's no continuity and, and to the point that um Cheryl made longevity and also, you know, the co continuity, I think is, is key. And that's something that we are struggling with a lot. Um, but keep reminding the regional organizations, the international organizations that are doing a lot of this work behind the scenes. It's incredible work, but I think it's, you have to be very pragmatic and realistic when you are working in small, uh, you know, small countries or developing countries that already have issues with resources, with manpower, and with funding to continue some of this work in terms of e data or even internet governance. Thanks. Well, no, thank you. Uh, thank uh, Fitriani, thank you, Michael. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope uh, it's been uh, a, you know, a, a good conversation for you in relation to all the complexities around the role of the different stakeholders, the different stages of, of uh, that data goes from production all the way to usage and benefits, the benefit that it can have to society and the impact it can, ha it can have in society, but also the need of, of doing it, uh, taking into consideration the interest of all the parties that are involved. So yeah, thank you very much. And, and with that, we can break for, for lunch. <laughs>